welcome to 17 square meters garden. If you're new to my channel, hi, I'm Dominika, I'm RHS certified horticulturist and urban gardener. I've been gardening on my urban terrace for about eight years now. And on my Instagram page, I opened the Q&A box and asked you guys if you had any questions about balcony and container gardening, anything I can possibly help you with. So I chose some of those questions. Unfortunately, I can't answer all of them because this video will be way too long. Uh, but I picked some questions that I think most people will be interested in and they cover general container gardening knowledge. So that's what we are going to do today. We are going to answer some of those questions. And because this video is probably going to be long anyway, uh, I'm going to put all the questions on the timeline so you can easily navigate through the video. If you don't want to watch the whole thing, you can click the specific question on the timeline and you can uh, navigate through the video this way. Also, there, was, there were quite a lot of questions in French, so I'm going to put the original question on the screen in French and then I'm going to translate it and answer it in English uh, to make it easy for everyone and for everyone to understand. Because in all cases, all of my videos are subtitled in French. Uh, you can click the video options, subtitles, French. I put a lot of time and effort to make it possible for you guys to watch each one of my videos with French translations. So you can turn those subtitles on to understand what I'm saying. So let's go. Let's start with the first question. Okay, the first question. Do you think plants in pots are a little bit more sensitive to cold than the ones in garden? Yes, that's a fact. Because plants grown in ground, obviously the soil isolates them. The plant roots can spread for, in search for water and nutrients. Um, and in containers, they live in a restricted environment. So the roots can spread in search for water and nutrients. They are fully dependent on you. So if you just neglect them a little bit, the plant becomes stressed and stressed plant is also more prone to pest and disease attacks. Um, and the only protection from frost that they have are the thin walls of the container. So for example, if you have a plant that is hardy down to zone 6 and you grow it in ground in zone 6, it's most likely going to survive. But the same plant grown in zone 6 in container may not survive winter because um, it is more susceptible to cold being grown in container. So yeah, definitely plants grown in containers are a little bit more high on the maintenance because they only have what you give them. So if you don't provide something, then they are more prone to, to stress and then to disease, to attacks and nutrient deficiencies and such. Okay, next question. Do you put expanded clay on the bottom of your pot? No, I do not. That's an old garden myth, something that people used to do back in the day, but it's no longer recommended um, because it can actually impede the drainage instead of improving it. I've seen way too many times those clay balls actually blocking the drainage holes and acting like a cork in the sink almost. Um, so your entire potting mix has to be well draining because if you have a poor quality potting mix that is not well draining, then the layer of gravel or clay balls at the bottom is not going to help anything. Um, so good quality potting mix that has either perlite, sand or grit in it, that's what's going to actually improve drainage in your, in your containers, not the layer of gravel at the bottom. So good quality potting mix, and obviously container that has drainage holes and then you're good to go. How often and when should I be fertilizing? You should be fertilizing your plants when they are actively growing. So for most plants that's going to be between early spring and um, mid to late summer. Um, how often? Well, that depends what fertilizer you use. If you use like granulated slow release fertilizer, then you give one dose of fertilizer in the spring and then again sometime mid-summer. Uh, but if you're using liquid fertilizers, which is something that I recommend, I feel like that's more practical for container-grown plants. So liquid fertilizers, you dilute them with water and you should be using them weekly. And you will need two fertilizers, one grow, one bloom. Grow fertilizer is a fertilizer that is rich in nitrogen that supports leafy growth and healthy plant development. You will be using it for your plants when they are just growing. And then once your plant starts to form flower buds, you switch to bloom fertilizer or fertilizer for the flowering phase, because that fertilizer is more rich in potassium and phosphorus, which are the two nutrients that your plant needs the most when it starts to flower, when it starts to produce fruit. Um, so yeah. Next question, what kind of tree can be grown in pots? Well, I like to say that every plant can be grown in pots, but not every plant will want to stay in that pot forever. Um, so technically any tree can be grown in pot as bonsai, right? But if we are talking about um, like balcony and container gardening, I wouldn't plant a tree taller than three meters tall because um, most balconies are small. So if you plant anything that's taller, it will look proportionally out of place. 
Uh, and also then it becomes top heavy and there's a risk of that plant falling in the wind. So choose something small, something dwarf, something slow growing. So technically any tree can be grown in pot, but if you are gonna plant something that wants to reach 25 meters at maturity, you may be able to grow it in container for two, three years, but then obviously you will have to transplant it somewhere in ground. Next question, do you remove bulbs every year from the pots? No, I don't. And actually there was a lot of questions about spring bulbs. Um, and I have a video dedicated to spring bulbs after care where I spoke all about spring bulbs, how I dig them up, how I store them, how I keep them in pots and all of that. And this video is called what I do with my spring bulbs once they are done blooming. So I will link that video at the end of this one. Uh, but no, I don't remove bulbs from pots every year. I keep some bulbs permanently in containers. Some I dig up and I store them and some I just get rid of. I don't keep all of the bulbs every year. Next, when you plant annual plants above your dormant bulbs, do the bulbs get wasted? Well, if they would, I wouldn't be doing that, right? No, they don't. Um, I figured long ago that that's something that we do in a real garden. Like we don't dig the bulbs up, right? We keep them in ground and we just plant flowers on top of them and around them. So I tried that in containers and it works really well. Though there are some things to take in consideration, obviously. I mean, you won't be able to do it with every bulb. Um, I usually just keep uh, Narcissus bulbs or Alliums, uh, but that's pretty much it. Uh, any smaller bulbs like Crocus, Pushkinia, Chinodoxa um, and stuff like that, you will have to dig them up because they are so small, so they are very close to the surface, so you won't be able to plant anything on top of them without disrupting the bulbs. Um, and then, obviously, if you want to keep the bulbs in container, um, the container has to be large enough. I mean, it doesn't have to be big, but it has to be large enough to fit the root ball of your bulbs and the root ball of the plant that's going to grow on top of it. And they don't rot or anything like that because the plant that is actively growing, it's sucking up all that moisture, you know? So the bulbs, they don't rot. But then again, you won't do it with every bulb. For example, I do it only with daffodils and with alliums and they do perfectly fine. What are some good plants slash flowers that tolerate high winds on a terrace? I hear ya, my terrace is very windy, exposed from all the sides. But the thing is that there isn't really a category of plants that are tagged as wind resistant because any plant, even the strongest of the trees, can break in the wind. Um, what is more important, you didn't mention whether your terrace is in the shade, in part sun, in full sun. That's also going to determine your choice of plants because we choose plants based on how much sun do we have, not based on how much wind do we have. So better to create windbreaks, put some wooden panels or some um, trellises, buy some taller trees and shrubs that are going to filter the wind. They don't necessarily need to take up too much space. Um, you can buy pleached trees and shrubs, so they have a clear trunk and they are grown on a grid and they're very flat. They don't take too much space and they are great at filtering the wind. And then once you filter that wind, once you create more sheltered spot, then you can grow whatever it is that you like on the floor below them or in front of them. Group plants together on the floor because then they protect one another. Buy, you know, plant stakes, plant frames and all of those plant supports that are gonna keep the plants, you know, straight, that are going to prevent plants from breaking. Um, yeah, because as I said, if you are going to only narrow down to really plants that can resist the wind, there you are not, then you are gonna, not going to find much because there isn't really much out there. I don't know, maybe some conifers, some European fan palm is also said to be wind resistant, agave or um, oleanders, stuff like that. But then again, it all comes down to um, how much sun do you have on your balcony. Next, where do you keep the pots that are not at their prime? They're all here. What is on the balcony stays on the balcony. I'm a huge advocate for year-round gardening. I post photos of my balcony, even in winter, so you can see all of the pots are still here. And I think that the key to gardening in such a small space like balcony garden is to create succession of year-round colors. So uh, to have something that uh, flowers or is at their prime at different times of the year. Uh, because then you focus on what is looking great at the moment and you don't focus on the plants that are dormant. Next question, should you replant crocus and tulips from one year to another? Uh, yes, you can keep crocus. Uh, actually, in that video that I just spoke about, the video where I show what I do with my spring bulbs, I dug up 450 crocus bulbs uh, and I showed how I'm cleaning them and storing them. So you can check that out. But yeah, you can totally keep crocus from year to year. Tulips, I do not recommend keeping tulips from year to year because Tulip bulb, once it blooms, it dies. So when you will dig up tulips, you will notice that there's not much of the bulb left. 
Um, and tulips don't tend to come back well from one year to another. So that bulb may create a bulblet on the side that is then going to come back and bloom next year. But most of the time it's not worth it and it's best to replant fresh tulips every year. Does this balcony have parts that are in the shade and what can you put in there? Yes, this balcony is entirely in the shade. It's north east facing with only a couple of hours of morning sunlight in summer. So pretty much anything that you see on my balcony, you could plant on your shade balcony as well. Uh, but some typical shade loving plants are hostas. They are beautiful foliage plants. They bloom in summer. There are different colors to choose from. The same for hookuras, different colors to choose from. Bloom early summer, late spring, early summer. They attract pollinators. Branera, uh, ornamental grasses like carex, um, ferns. Uh, and from flowering plants, you could plant begonias. You can plant impatiens, pansies and violas. They also do well. Virginia. So yeah, that's some of some ideas for your shade garden. What soil do you use? I just started and there are so many options. That's true, there are so many options out there, but generally you will use, um, I mean, there are four different types of potting mix that you may use. Uh, first is seeds and cuttings potting mix. So if you grow a lot of plants from seeds or if you propagate a lot of plants, that's the potting mix that you will choose. Then the one that you will probably use the most often is multi-purpose potting mix. Um, so you can plant pretty much anything in it, so it's um, good to take a good quality one, so a one that has some organic matter in it that contains perlite for aeration. My preferred one is Light Mix by Playground. Um, then the third type is a soil-based potting mix, so it contains actual garden soil and it's a potting mix that is suitable for trees and shrub and more mature perennials. And then the last one is a ericaceous potting mix, a potting mix that has a low pH because some plants like blueberries, camellias or rhododendrons, they require a low pH in order to grow healthy. So these are the four main types of potting mix. Um, but if you are just a beginner, uh, then buy yourself a good quality multi-purpose potting mix and you can grow pretty much anything in it. How to stop cats from pooing in the planters? Uh, well, if these are your cats, I think that would be a good idea to plant containers just for them, you know, to keep them away from your other plants. But in order to do it, you have to plant something that cats are attracted by. Um, so there are two plants from mint family, from genus Nepeta, that cats are particularly fond of. It's cat mint and cat nip. So cat nip, it's Nepeta cataria, and it contains a compound called Nepeta lactone. And it gives cats that drugged effect, you know, that makes them enthusiastic. Um, and the other one is cat mint, it's Nepeta mucinii. It doesn't seem to have that effect on cats, but they still like it. So if you plant one of those two or both of them, uh, there's a chance that your cat will stay away from your actual plants and will be more attracted to those. Uh, but if we're talking about a situation where you have a garden and you have like neighbor's cats coming to your garden, then I think uh, better would be to use some animal repellents. These are not poisons, they are just repellents. So they are like um, essential oil-based uh, granules. They don't have unpleasant smell for humans, but they have unpleasant smell for animals. So if you sprinkle some in your garden, it can, you know, repel cats or other uh, creatures. Uh, but you will have to reapply this quite often because, you know, as it rains, it washes off. So it has to be reapplied, but it's also an option. How to deal with aphids? They are killing all of my plants. I already spoke a little bit about aphids in my April tour and I explained how, first of all, it's normal to have aphids. You will always have some pests in the garden. Your garden can't be sterile because aphids are part of the food chain. They provide food for beneficial creatures like ladybirds, hoverfly larvae, um, lacewing larvae, all of those creatures, they feed on aphids. So aphids always will be in your garden. Um, and also, I said that aphids can't really kill your plant. Aphids are just like little mosquitoes. They are drinking sap out of your plant. But if you say that all of your plants are dying, then that's something wrong with the maintenance here because all of your plants can die just because of a few aphids on them. I showed my alpine strawberry. It's covered in aphids. There are aphids everywhere on it. And the plant is thriving, it's blooming, it produces berries. But it's really important to take a good care of your plants, to grow healthy, strong plants, because a healthy, strong plant will withstand infestation. Uh, and if your plant is stressed, if your plant is weak, then aphids, they can sense it and they are going to go on that plant and they are going to weaken it more. So it's important to take a good care of your plants, to grow plants uh, in their optimal conditions, to meet all of their requirements so that they are strong and they can withstand that aphid infestation. 
Um, but I understand that if you have so many aphids in your garden, there's something that you want to do about it. So the good idea here will be to uh, introduce predators in your garden. So you can buy yourself ladybird larvae online. You can spread them in your garden. Then they are going to take a good care of all of those aphids. They're going to eat them. But here you need to be patient as well because they are not going to eat all of those aphids in one week or two weeks. It's going to take three, four weeks before they clean up your garden a little. Um, and they are going to leave some aphids because it is their food. So they are not going to eat all of their food all at once. Uh, they are going to keep the pop aphid population very low. But then again, you have to tolerate a few aphids in your garden. That's normal. That's natural to have some aphids in the garden. Bad idea would be to use pesticides because pesticides are non-selective. So they are going to kill both aphids and the beneficial creatures. And I think that it will be sad, you know, because we grow all of those plants. I think not only for us, for ourselves, but also to support wildlife, to support uh, urban biodiversity. So it will be sad to, to go to all this effort to grow all of these plants and only to kill beneficial creatures because you have a few aphids on your plant. I think that would be a shame. Uh, so please don't use pesticides. Neem oil is also a pesticide. Neem oil kills honeybees, so please don't use it in your garden. You can use it on your houseplants, but please don't use it in your garden because it's going to kill beneficial creatures, and I think that's a shame. So instead of using pesticides, encourage beneficial creatures into your garden, and as I said, you can buy yourself larvae online that are predatory, that are going to keep the aphid infestation under control. Okay guys, so this is gonna be it for today's Q&A video. I do hope that you enjoyed it and that you learned something new. Thanks so much for joining me today and I'll see you again in the next video. Bye!